There are very few moments that leave me more comically flustered than the first time I went to Fojo. I'd just gotten my first campus job paycheck of the semester, so of course I was rich. And how do you show people at Hamilton that you're rich? You buy something from Fojo. <laughs> and so I had to show people I'm rich etched onto my calendar, and on the day, I had a certain bounce in my step. I said hello to everyone on the way, so that they could see where I was going. I felt very important that day. When I got to Fojo, I already had my credit card out because I was a man on a mission. There was only one person in front of me, and soon it would be my turn to flaunt my wealth. I heard the barista ask the very nice lady ahead of me, hi, what can I get for you today? The response, could I please get a hot mocha latte made with almond milk and a double shot of espresso and this other thing and some other, other thing, I think I heard pepperoni thrown in there and some more espresso. Now, you have to understand that at this point, I am completely perplexed. What am I about to get myself into? Are we ordering drinks or reciting the coffee pledge of allegiance? I'm standing in line sweating because I can't leave because then everyone will assume that my wealth is non-existent. There was no other way. I was a man on a mission. When it was my turn to order coffee, the very kind barista asked me the same question. Hi, what can I get for you today? I looked at the menu. I looked at her. I looked back at the menu. I back at her. And I said, could I uh, get an empty cup, please? I took that cup, went upstairs to McEwen, found the coffee station, poured myself some coffee, and went on with my date. No one would know the difference. But there's something more to this story beyond the fact that I malfunction when ordering coffee. When faced with a plethora of choices, I'm not always sure which one the right one is. The questions of which classes to take, or friend groups to join, or coffee to order, are at the forefront of many Hamilton students' minds. So how do we decide? How should we decide? These are very important questions to ask because work done by psychologist Joseph Ferrari shows that about 20% of adults are indecisive. That means at least one in five of the people in this room struggle with everyday decisions. As such, it is important that we consider what could be done to rectify this. There's a virtue ethical concept in ancient philosophy called the doctrine of the mean that has tickled my intellectual fancy since first running across it. And I would like to explore it with you all today. I'll begin with some prefatory information on the doctrine before pivoting to its tenets and then highlighting what it challenges us to do. And before I continue, I'd like to extend my gratitude to Justin Clark, my philosophy advisor, and the person who has guided me in my understanding of virtue ethics. It's a warm summer evening in ancient Greece, circa 340 BC. A young Aristotle is hard at work, working on what would be considered one of his most influential texts, Nicomachean Ethics. It is a fascinating philosophical offering that he churns, and within it is the doctrine of the mean, a concept that has provided a framework for how we deal with virtue and vice. Now, it is at this point that people say to me, Tinashe, we have no idea what virtue and vice mean. To which I say, neither do I. But thankfully, Aristotle gives us an idea. He points to virtue as the joint excellence of emotions and desires when they're made fully integrated and precise with reason. In essence, is whatever is happening here, coherent with what is happening here. Good decisions only come as a result of this coherence, per Aristotle. As such, reason must be made one with that which is acted upon. This is corroborated by contemporary scholars such as Julia Annis, a virtue ethicist at the University of Arizona, who defines virtue as a disposition to do the right thing in the right way for the right reason. Vice, then, would be a state in which, virtue, in which emotions and desires stray from what is most reasonable to do. It is here that Aristotle's doctrine of the mean is born. Good decisions for Aristotle come from habit. How do you make good decisions? Well, you start by making decisions and work your way up to good ones. And in the process, you must be aware of your personal tendencies. This is important for Aristotle because he says that we respond to different situations differently. As such, we must be keenly aware of our, of our natural wiring, that is, what we're drawn to. And this is also supported by psychologist Gregory Mayo's work, which shows that people make better decisions when they're aware of what they like and dislike, extensively when they're aware of what they're good at and not so good at. Where someone seamlessly knows all the Fojo ingredients, another person does not. The one who does not must be aware of their limitations before making a decision. And the one that does must be careful not to overdo things. And whatever both people decide to do must lie within a mean, Aristotle says. It is here that things get a bit more complex. 
When Aristotle says mean, he does not necessarily mean find whatever is in the middle for the options before you. Rather, he argues that the right decision lies somewhere between two extremes, an extreme of excess and one of deficiency, unique to the situation that the person finds themselves in. An example. It would probably suck if I just spoke like this for the whole speech. It would also probably suck if I just spoke like this for the whole speech. And now I'm back in the middle. And this is fine, except if I want to become a more effective speaker, I'll most likely raise my voice when I want to emphasize a point. And then when I want to really back in, I might start speaking something like this, because the situation dictates so. So whatever decision that I make must lie somewhere between these two extremes, Aristotle would tell, would tell me. But never on that end, and never on that end, somewhere in between. And for Aristotle, it all comes down to phronesis. And at this point, if you're wondering, Tinashe, what is phronesis? Well, first of all, stop yelling. We just spoke about this. But also, I actually know this one. I was paying attention in class on the day. Phronesis is an evaluative capacity within us that makes us consider our lives as a whole. That is, what matters most to us. Philosopher Daniel Russell, also from the University of Arizona, defines phronesis as an excellence in practical reasoning whereby one defines their ends well. As such, Russell shows us that Aristotle's phronesis challenges us to consider what, what's most important for us. What is the end that we all seek? And this is key in understanding the Aristotelian doctrine of the mean, because Aristotle says that that which matters most to you will permeate into your daily living and seep into your decision making. If flaunting your, if flaunting your wealth by buying Fojo coffee is your life's mission, the decisions you make will so reflect. To summarize, Aristotle says that right decisions lie somewhere between two extremes, an extreme of excess and an extreme of vice. You must be careful and understand yourself whenever dealing with these extremes. That way you can, be, you can situationally, you can respond to situations appropriately, knowing yourself and knowing what the situation dictates, somewhere between ex excess and deficiency. In its most rudimentary sense, this is part of what Aristotle's doctrine of the mean proposes. I went back to Fojo recently, and when I got to the front, I said, hi. I whispered so no one could find out. I had no idea what I was doing. I asked the barista, what's the most outrageous thing that people order? She gave me a response. I then asked, what's the most basic thing that people order? I also got another response. I looked at the menu, then I looked at her, looked back at the menu, then I looked at her, and I said, could you please give me something that is somewhere in between? Thank you. <laughs> Can I just run away or the questions? Are we, we're not, we're still doing this. Okay, great questions. And thank you all for listening. I hope I didn't totally bore all of you with philosophy on a Saturday afternoon. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's a brilliant question. Thank you so much for asking it. Did everyone hear that, or should I repeat that? Everyone heard it? Great. Okay. So. Virtue ethics is about virtue and ethics. So in preparing for this speech, I was very aware of the fact that I'm probably going to be talking about people who may not be as into philosophy as I am. And so I tried to use everyday examples so that people could get a sense of what I was talking about. And so coffee probably wouldn't be on Aristotle's mind as much as what justice is or what courage is, or what honesty is. See, these are big things. I would have probably bored all of you if I said, hey, let's talk about courage on a Saturday afternoon. What do you think courage is? Right? So I, I used that coffee example, hoping that people would somewhat grasp what I was trying to get at, at making decisions that are somewhere here, not too much in this end, and not too much in this end. And in terms of how that affects people, and this is something that uh, people who oppose virtue ethics normally bring up, that it's a selfish thing, it's just you, we're making decisions. How do we square with that? But 
the person who has, um, the person who understands deeply this uh, virtue ethics and what Aristotle is trying to say will also understand that for me to exist in a society, I need other people. So generosity is very important. I can't be generous to myself. I can try, but that's going to involve other people. Courage is going to involve other people. Justice is going to involve other people. And so the virtues that Aristotle is talking about involve other people in that way. Sure. Yeah, for sure. So this is a tricky one because virtue ethics, oh, free will, we're talking about free will. So this is a tricky one because virtue ethics essentially says the most important thing in life is virtue. It's right here, right? So you come after that. But you're still an active agent in that you're rational. So Aristotle was a, bio, he, he was a biologist, right? He's into biology, all the fun stuff, nature, all those things fascinated him. And so for Aristotle, he tried to understand the human psyche in that Human beings are very rational people, somewhat, you know, somewhat were very rational. So rationality is at the forefront of Aristotle's thinking when he's working on the doctrine of the mean too. So he understands that people will make decisions. Now the decision is up to you, ultimately. You can choose to ignore the doctrine, right? So that's, in a sense, where free will is, come, is coming in. You can choose to ignore that, but you risk doing too much or doing too little. And I think there's a very great parts to add to that. It's not one mean, so something that's just right there in the middle, too. You can move a bit closer to this side, you can move a bit closer to this side, but never too much on either end. I think that's where Aristotle is coming in. So it's not like, have courage, and courage is this one thing. It's have courage, but courage looks like this. It looks like this. It maybe also looks like this. And so you ultimately have to end up making the decision, and hopefully you don't do anything that burns the world down. Perfect, thank you.